this is a great opportunity for me, I think, as um, some of you who I was able to talk to outside uh, a bit may know. Um, I uh, am not a specialist on uh, China or on India, for that matter. Um, but as the editor of the journal in the Washington Quarterly, have a global security portfolio and responsibility. And that allows me to travel about, uh, or I try to travel at least sort of about three weeks a year in uh, an effort to get an appreciation for views from outside of Washington and outside the United States of the security issues on which we're focusing, both in the journal and in Washington, as well as on issues that we may not be looking at, and some of the concerns exist in other places in the world. Usually, over the course of that time, about one week a year, I'm able to travel to Asia, and the other week or two, I tend to go to European countries. I was actually in France and Germany uh, last month in December before the Christmas holidays. And over the course of the last uh, 10 years or so, um, I kind of stumbled into a network with China that has allowed me some insight from Chinese colleagues that work at universities and think tanks in China and the opportunity to travel in China, which as an American is not uh, always easy unless you're invited in particular. In about 2000, 2001 or so, there was one of a number of what we call sort of emerging, uh, uh, emerging experts or emerging dialogues. And what that meant was they looked for a series of people in China who specialized on the United States and in the United States who specialized on China, most of whom were in their 30s to start a network of uh, scholars that would come together annually, alternately in China and in the United States, um, to learn about each other. And in uh, a time in which the dialogue between China and the United States was very scarce at about uh, 2000, about just under 10 years after the Cold War had ended, at a time when you couldn't breathe the word Taiwan in any dialogue between US and China scholars, something that's changed fairly dramatically over the course of the last 10 years or so. And effectively what happened is I got lucky because in the first dialogue between the two groups, which I was not a part of in 2002, it was about five months after the September 11th attacks in the United States. And at that time, the Chinese experts who were part of the group came to the Americans and said, all right, you guys have turned your foreign policy uh, focus entirely in the aftermath of these attacks. So where does China fit in US foreign policy priorities? And the Americans effectively kind of looked around at each other and one of them answered and said, we spend all our time looking at you guys and have no idea where it would fit in foreign policy overall. And so at the next dialogue, I was invited to go and participate as someone who had a global portfolio of responsibilities. And that has allowed me both to travel to China on an annual basis, or at least about every 18 months, uh, seven times over the last 10 years, as well as host some of those scholars who have subsequently either worked at the embassy in Washington or who have traveled to Washington with their uh, colleagues from the think tanks or the universities at which they work and have a much more candid dialogue over time that's given me a little bit of an insight as to somebody who is not a specialist on China um, into what's going on in China and in US-China relations. The answer to the question, the real uh, China challenge that Shanna previewed, in my opinion, is the transitions or the uncertainty that China is going through. And I'll mention in the remarks at the beginning, which I'd like to try and transition into a dialogue with all of you for the time that remains after I'm done talking, in four particular transitions over the course of the last five to six years. For me and the way that I was introduced to these uh, scholars and, and uh, colleagues, some of whom have become friends from China over those 10 years, is that a lot of the scholars had looked in the very beginning to ask the question that as China's power rises, how can it avoid the historical challenge or the historical likelihood that there would be some type of conflict between the rising power and the declining power? And the answer that the Chinese approached those dialogues with is that what history shows is that there was one successful case of a transition of a rising power and a declining power that did not end up in some type of conflict between those powers. And that was the transition from Britain to the United States after World War II as the major global power. And the conclusion that the Chinese scholars had reached was that the way to best try and replicate that transition and minimize any kind of risk as China's power and its economy continued to rise over time that led to the formulation of the Chinese foreign policy doctrine of the peaceful rise was to become as closely associated and as friendly with the United States as possible. 
and that that was the key to the British transition to the United States, is that they were in fact allies through World War II, and that as the British power declined and American power rise, that friendship and those common interests allowed for that transition of power without a major global conflict in the one successful case in history that they had been able to come to. That was the premise of most of the dialogues that started in about 2002, 2003. And what I've seen in some very candid interactions over the course of the last five to six years or so is that there is increasing doubt within China, not just about the wisdom of that strategy, but about whether it was possible given the tensions and the historical relationships between China and the United States that preceded uh, those academic conclusions in 2000, 2001 over four particular areas. The first seeds of doubt about whether that strategy would be effective for China that I saw were in 2006 to 2008, at a time where globally there was a lot of attention on global climate change. And what had been brought in attention to me, as uh, Shanna mentioned in my dialogue, that was particularly at a time when I was working on a project about the national security implications of global climate change. And so I hadn't traveled to China intending to talk about these subjects, but it was a subject that came up uh, frequently both because of the international conferences around Cancun and Copenhagen later in 2008, 2009 in its anticipation, and also in the requests that were being made to China to either change its economic and development strategy or to contribute uh, to different ways of offsetting some of the risks of global climate change going forward. The conclusion that a lot of the Chinese scholars were increasingly making over time was that the demands that China was being asked to change its economic development strategy because of global climate change were retarding Chinese economic growth. And they were being asked to make sacrifices that China was not responsible for because it was mostly the fault of countries in the West for the global climate change that had evolved over time and that they were being made to ask economic sacrifices in ways that were not fair for China and were not in China's interests. That was the first or the beginning of the seeds of a transition in China's mind about global governance and about its potential for China to work with other countries through a system of global governance and whether that was consistent with a Chinese national economic development strategy. Given the challenges that I know many of you are familiar with in India, in China's case of trying to raise the per capita income level of 1.3 billion people. And that frankly, in many people's minds, it was simply too expensive to be asked to contribute to the challenges of global governance, given the state of its own development and the economic challenges going forward. Now, while that in its own right was a fair enough question or a fair enough series of national calculations for China to be going through, it expanded a little bit after the financial crisis in 2008 which subsequently accelerated a lot of China's questions about the ability to work with the United States and have a smooth transition or a peaceful rise in its own domestic debates. In particular, after the uh, financial crisis in 2008, China was increasingly being asked to help bail out Europe and to help Europe through its own challenges as it struggled with the financial crisis. And that expanded the global climate change debate within China beyond just the climate change issue to a broader one of global governance. And it became framed in some people's minds or some colleagues of the colleagues who I spoke with that candidly told me and said, what's happening is that basically China is beginning to view the global governance agenda as a backdoor way of containment. That it was being viewed as a strategy to restrain Chinese economic development by increasingly heaping demands on China to help assist with bailing out the Europeans on the financial crisis, contributing to global climate change, changing its own development strategy. And now where we're seeing uh, in its own development strategy as it puts focus economically on urbanization as a central way to spread its economic development to the interior of the country, environmental questions being raised through things like the United States' National Intelligence Council 2030 report that was released last month that all this sequence of events on environmental demands, economic demands, and elsewhere to help other parts of the world were coming at a time where China's per capita development was so low, even while its aggregate stance internationally was as the second largest economic power. And it viewed those demands on it as a way to slow down its own economic development 
detract China from its priorities of raising the standard of living in China and slow down the spread of wealth in China from the coastal areas that had developed to the interior areas that needed further development in China itself. So the global governance demands were increasingly retarding China and were a backdoor way for Western countries to restrain and slow Chinese growth in the interest of Western countries uh, that should be responsible for bailing Europe out of the financial crisis and addressing the concerns of global climate change. That was the first set of transitions, is the Chinese view of global governance has become much more difficult. That it is in some people's minds in China, and this is not necessarily across the spectrum in China, but at least there is a widespread debate within Chinese policy circles about whether global governance is a trap to restrain Chinese economic growth. The second Chinese uh, transition that we saw, or that I'm seeing, is on the economic challenges. And the interesting one here is how this started to evolve in the state capitalism debate that was mentioned in the introduction five years ago, and how it has really changed, or more than five years ago, ten years ago, and how it has really changed in the last three to five years in ways that I'll mention briefly. The state capitalism debate, or what the Chinese economic model is, frankly starts with an incredible amount of uncertainty about what the Chinese economic model actually is. The literature on this has kind of gone through about four different phases. In the first phase was there was a report written by a European scholar named Joshua Ramos Cooper called the Beijing Consensus that really identified the dynamism of Chinese economic policy as the principal defining factor of the Chinese economic model, so to speak. This debate got so widespread in the United States about forms of authoritarian capitalism, is one word for it, or a book that a American analyst named Ian Bremmer wrote that talked about state capitalism, which is the model that we more commonly hear of today as the brand for what the Chinese economic model actually is. The debate got so uncertain in some Chinese scholars' views that there was actually an editorial in the uh, Chinese paper, The Global Times, which is associated with the Communist Party and the government in China, that in, basically asked Chinese scholars to begin to contribute to the debate about what the Chinese economic model actually was. Most of the scholars that I interacted with said that there is no such thing as the Chinese economic model because it's changing so quickly that consistent with what uh, Ramos Cooper's conclusions were was that that was the principal defining factor. It was not a model, but it was a commitment to dynamism and to change, to keep up with the evolving challenges that face the Chinese economy and that shaped the global economy as globalization went forward in the last two decades. In response, that were, that I've not seen a lot of Chinese uh, scholars that have engaged in this in response to the Global Times articles or elsewhere. But there was an overlooked piece of economic theory that can help contribute to the understanding of what the Chinese economic model might be. And that is something called the financial trilemma. While most people that focus on the Chinese economic model focus on state ownership of Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese property and of Chinese businesses and the state-owned enterprises that are now such a challenge for the new Chinese government going forward that the other part of the Chinese economic model that got much less analytical attention was how they answered this so-called financial trilemma. The financial trilemma was an economic theory that won the Nobel Prize for economics in 2001 at a time when most uh, analysts of global politics were focusing on the emergence of al-Qaeda and terrorism. The financial trilemma basically concluded or concludes that countries can do two out of three things on a triangle. They can have an independent monetary policy, they can have open capital markets, they can manage their exchange rates. But basically they can do two of these three things for economic reasons that I'm not going to begin to understand or explain, but they can't do all three of them. Nearly every country chooses to have an independent monetary policy as part of the way that the government manages the economic challenges for its own people, so inflation, unemployment, and others. But the answer by uh, certainly Western economies since uh, the Cold War itself had responded to the financial trilemma with the free market, that they kept capital markets open and they kept exchange rates freely floating in order to address the economic challenges of the times that faced them during the Cold War. 
And this was certainly not only true of the United States, but of other countries throughout Europe uh, as well uh, during the course of the Cold War. The Chinese model of state capitalism was, in some people's minds, a unique response that flipped that free market answer on its head and that not only emphasized the state ownership of property and of, 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 of private uh, markets or of enterprises, but also chose capital controls and chose to manage its exchange rates. The challenge in my mind that that confronted was actually not a unique choice that China made, but that China was the most obvious example of a series of countries that were entering the global system during the age of globalization that faced different economic challenges than the Western countries that had chosen the free market faced when, it, when they made their decision to keep capital markets open and keep exchange rates floating. In fact, the Chinese decisions in that basic model of answering the financial trilemma were not unique to China, but they were ones that Thailand had chosen, that Brazil had chosen, that India had chosen, and that others had chosen in their own responses, particularly to the Asian financial crisis in the 1990s and elsewhere. Essentially what was happening is that the countries that engaged in the decision as to how to answer the financial trilemma during the age of globalization faced completely different economic challenges on at least two fronts. In the first case, what drove countries like China to maintain capital controls was the linkage of economic activity to the internet. When you could make decisions that would pull capital investments out of a country at the flip of a computer keystroke, it made the volatility of financial markets infinitely faster than they were during the Cold War when other countries had made their decisions to keep their capital markets open. So for countries like China that made those decisions to engage the global community in its interactions, and we're not behind uh, the decisions during the Cold War to keep the, its markets contained. Those countries faced much greater financial volatility if it's kept their capital markets open. And that made the challenges of open capital markets much greater for them. The second basic economic theoretical challenge that countries like China and others faced was what the source of economic growth was. And here the difference was in economic theory. At the time in the 1950s to the 1970s, the countries decided to choose the free market and keep their exchange rates floating on the international financial system. Those countries uh, did not have to face some of the decisions that the Chinese faced. And, they faced the, and the calculation was that engaging in trade was what drove economic growth. That free trade was the engine of global economic growth during the course of the Cold, of the Cold War, particularly among uh, Western countries as well as Japan and others that engaged in the Western free market. Conversely, what, other, uh, what the other countries that we're facing now was a, a development of economic theory that traced the linkage of economic growth not to free trade generally, but to exports specifically. In other words, what drove, what drove growth was not both the exports and imports of trade, but it was actually exports that gave an external market to countries, but allowed for the production of economic goods to be located within one's own borders, meaning the jobs were in the, your own country, and that meant the salaries were within your own country, and that raised the standard of living in your own country to be able to export elsewhere. So it wasn't free trade broadly, but it was export specifically that drove economic growth. And this was a development of economic theory that had taken place over the course of the last 30 to 40 years up until that time. So essentially, the second transition or question was, was the Chinese state capitalist system a fundamental rejection of the free market model that not only China but other countries, as I said, Brazil, Thailand, India, others, were deciding that the free market was effectively outdated because the financial volatility of economic activity being linked to the internet was too great to maintain free capital markets. And the conclusion that it was exports that were driving a country's economy meant that countries would tilt their exchange rates in favor of exports out of their own country 
to be able to keep jobs and salaries within their own country's borders, raising their standard of living, and exporting goods elsewhere. The problem in part was not just an ideological one about free markets versus this new answer to the financial trilemma. But the problem was that if every country in the global international system made the decision to follow that example, with China being the largest of it, it was by definition an unsustainable international uh, global economic order. If every country sought to export out of its own country to others, then the ones that would import would be the losers. And if every country sought to maintain capital controls on its own country, it would build insular capital markets in ways that were not conducive to global integration and global interactivity. In essence, what would happen was you would have a series of countries that would be seeking to tilt their exchange rates in favor of exports out of their countries, leading to what's called a currency war, or a series of countries that were each, each tilting those uh, exports or those exchange rates in favor of its own country and leapfrogging one another in how much they could tilt to export out of their country, leading to currency instability in ways that would keep the global economic order unstable. The challenge then for what the Chinese economic example or this financial element of state capitalism might present was that if other countries follow the Chinese lead and the Chinese example was viewed successful, it would lead to an unstable global economic order and a global financial crisis because of, uh, because of that currency war or that potential for uh, instability on currency trading. The irony of all that and explaining all that economic theory behind that is that at precisely the time that these debates started to get engaged in 2009 to 2011, China is in the process of abandoning that model in its own economic activity. One of the lessons that China has taken away from the financial crisis, as I mentioned before, is the concern in China about the dependence of global financial markets on the US dollar. For years, if not decades, or the short decades, decade and a half, that China has been engaged in an international economic integration. The concern has been that if there were a financial difficulties with the dollar in ways that have been seen during the Asian financial crisis with the Thai bot, that that would lead to a global financial crisis that we frankly saw elements of on, in its order in 2008. And that China felt it was in the interest of the global financial community, and certainly in China's interest itself, which has so many of its investments in dollar-denominated assets, so that the Chinese economy is in turn dependent on the dollar. That China looked for other stores of international wealth, other currencies in which it could make investments, so that it could reduce that dependence of both the Chinese national system and the global economic system on the US dollar. China has sought for a number of years, along with a number of other countries, to develop a basket of goods that would diffuse that economic dependence on the dollar to the euro, the yen, other forms of international currency that are internationally tradable, that would be able to stabilize the international financial system if there were problems with one currency, as they were afraid would develop with the dollar, and we subsequently saw develop with the dollar in 2007, 2008, and 2009. In other words, if the Asian financial crisis went global. In the response in, to, the, uh, to the global financial crisis, in one of my trips over to China at, the, uh, at one of their think tanks closely associated with one of the foreign policy uh, institutions, I had a colleague pull me aside and basically uh, talk about the increasing debate within China that was emerging about whether China should in fact respond positively to the pressure that the US government and others were putting on China to revalue its currency, to make it more internationally tradable, to make it less of an engine of exports that drove the export economy, as was mentioned in some of the introductory remarks, and to shift the Chinese economy in a way that had long been planned in two directions, frankly. One of which was to move it from an export-driven economy to one that would be driven by domestic economic growth as its standard of living had risen at least in the coastal areas, as it had been seen because of China's economic rise over the previous 15 years. That now the debate was beginning in Chinese economic policy circles about whether it was time to make that transition from using currency to tilt economic markets in exports 
to use Chinese domestic production more as the engine of economic growth for China because it had seen some of the export markets dry up after the global financial crisis as Europe and the United States and others struggled with how to respond. That it was basically forcing the Chinese economic transition from that export-driven economy to a consumption-driven economy or a domestic-driven economy. At the same time, what Chinese financial scholars and financial policy decision makers were starting to question is whether China had to make its own currency available as an alternative to the US dollar. Whether because of the political and economic problems that Japan was having, whether because of the financial crisis and the difficulties that Europe was having, those other international currencies that China had been looking to develop as ballasts or as alternatives to spread the uh, economic investments and reduce the financial dependence of the international system on the US dollar. That China could no longer pressure other countries to step forward and make their currencies more competitive with the dollar. But that China had to make its own currency as an alternative to the US dollar over the course of the next generation or so, the next 10 or 20 years. The reason my Chinese counterpart pulled me aside is he said, how do you think Washington is going to respond to that? And my answer was, it's not going to be real good. Because it will be perceived as a way that China is looking to usurp US power by making the Chinese currency as the storage of international wealth as an alternative to the dollar. It would be the China's financial way of seeking to push the United States aside as a major global power, particularly in conservative circles in the United States, and raise concerns that China was seeking to be number one and push the US aside in the financial elements of power, even while there was military competition and other forms of power. So at precisely the time that people were beginning to ask the question, is state capitalism an alternative that might threaten the free market in today's interconnected, interdependent global marketplace, the Chinese are abandoning that model, effectively demonstrating it as a transitional strategy for emerging powers, but that for major powers, the financial system would be unstable because of that risk of currency wars, and that China was moving to a free market system while maintaining more capital controls than Western countries would have, making its currency more convertible and answering the financial trilemma in a way more consistent with the way that Western countries had answered the trilemma by making its own currency convertible on the international marketplace over the course of the next generation. And that's one thing that's important to understand is this is a project that will take at, at least a generation, optimistically in some Chinese scholars' minds it might take 10 years, but it would take 20 to where it is fully convertible and has confidence in international marketplaces to be able to present an alternative to the dollar as a currency rather than a system of state capitalism as the competition for the free market. That's the second of the four transitions. The other two transitions I'll mention are much shorter and much easier to explain because they don't involve economic theory. If that first transition was China's views of global governance are becoming much more, have become much more skeptical over the last five to seven years. And the second transition is that the Chinese economic challenge is moving from a systemic challenge of state capitalism to a currency challenge of the, of the of yuan as an alternative to the dollar for investments in international wealth. The third transition in China is its own foreign policy transition and whether China should change some of the foreign policy tenets that have been held since at least Deng Xiaoping in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Some of my American expert, uh, friends who are experts on China have talked about this, that there is a particular 24 character missive that has been used for a long period of time, at least since 1989 that roughly translated into English advises that in Chinese foreign policy, China should lay low, bide our time, and achieve something. Essentially not get too far out in front of itself as a major actor on the international stage before its own internal development challenges had been answered. In the summer of 2009, 20 years later, in a little noticed statement, Hu Jintao had issued a different and slight tweak on this theory. The theory uh, in Hu Jintao's phrasing in 2009 was that China should uphold keeping a low profile or continue that, but actively achieve something. 
Now, for those that follow Chinese foreign policy, the implications of these one-word changes are dramatic because of how consistent Chinese foreign policy thinkers are in returning to the use of the phrases and key characters like this 24-character missive that had led US experts on China to engage in a series of dialogues with their counterparts, asking them to explain the implications of what this new term meant and Hu Jintao's new formulation of this term meant in Chinese foreign policy circles. In American foreign policy circles, this got stumbled into something that uh, emerged over the course of 2008 to 2010 as the principal issue that has changed, I think, the relationship between the United States and China to make it much more tense because of the South China Sea, or the principal issue in the last five years that has made it much more tense because of uh, Chinese activity and disputes in the South China Sea over its sovereignty claims with its uh, Southeast Asian neighbors that is now spread up to the East China Sea in concerns of its uh, uh, territorial claims with Japan over the Senkaku or Diaoyu Islands. In this foreign policy debate in the United States, two American bureaucrats went over to China in preliminary talks before Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's visit to, uh, to China and subsequently Barack Obama's trip um, that was coming uh, over the, the coming uh, months. In that initial bureaucratic visit, there was a new phrase that was issued that led uh, alarm bells to go off in American minds. The phrase was that the Chinese interlocutors who was from the PLA or from the Chinese military talked about the South China Sea being a core national interest of China's or a vital national interest. The significance of that statement was to US foreign policy uh, analysts and officials, that phrase core interest or vital national interest is one that is typically diplomatic language for something over which the government is willing to use military force. And this was the first time any American official in a dialogue had ever heard China characterizing the South China Sea as something that was of a core national interest or a vital national interest. It had been previously reserved for issues of territorial concern for Chinese uh, sovereignty, such as Taiwan, Tibet, Xinjiang, and others that it had clearly said was of their national interest because it was considered part of China's territorial identity. And this was the first time that that territorial identity had been extended to the South China Sea. In a follow-up meeting Secretary Clinton had with uh, Chinese officials, she asked whether that word was intentionally used and whether it was the position of the Chinese government outside of the PLA officer that had used it in the preliminary talks at lower levels with the American officials that had approached them. And there has frankly been a massive translational debate about whether the term that was explained back to Hillary Clinton by her counterpart in the Chinese uh, state counselor, Dai Binguo, reaffirmed, in fact, it was. The immediate Americans in the meeting that responded to it, that reported it to Hillary Clinton, affirmed that it had in fact been used again, that it was a vital national interest. There were subsequently debates about whether it had been mistranslated or not. And when I went to China in 2010, in the same meeting that somebody had pulled me to side to ask me about how the United States might react to China making its currency internationally convertible to challenge the US dollar or to serve as a ballast for the US dollar, Another official at that same, another Chinese, I shouldn't say official, another Chinese think tank uh, analyst at that meeting basically said to me that there was a new statement by the Chinese state counselor, by the equivalent of their national security advisor, that was releasing a statement in the journal of that think tank. And this think tank was the state counselor's or his think tank that talked about and redefined Chinese national interests collectively or globally. The scholar said, take a look at the translation closely because you will notice that one of the terms that, or the, one of the areas that China defines as a core national interest or as its vital national interest is not the South China Sea. In other words, what seems to have happened is that there was an internal debate that was ongoing in China from 2008 going forward, particularly between dimensions of the Chinese military about whether China should be more assertive of its claims in the South China Sea in the face of China's perception that other Southeast Asian neighbors were being more assertive about their claims of the South China Sea. 
and the notorious string of pearls strategy that Chinese military officers have talked about was one that China should implement more actively, be more vocal about, and should push back against this pressure that they had seen in their mind from their Southeast Asian neighbors on the increasing territorial claims over the South China Sea and some of the energy interests that might be associated with those territorial claims. What the officials were saying from the state counselor's office was whether this was intended as something or not, whether there were circles outside of the military that sought to pursue this strategy or not, Dai Bing Guo's statement was meant as a way for China to save face by backing off of that claim that it was a vital national interest or to clarify or back off one or the other, depending on what you think of the internal Chinese bureaucratic debate, that it spilled out into the interactions with its American interlocutors. And that China was not making the South China Sea a vital or a core national interest, which would escalate the threat of military conflict in pursuit of its territorial claims in that area. It was not going to say that publicly was how I interpreted what my Chinese colleagues were telling me, because it would be perceived as a sign of weakness that in the face of U.S. statements at the ASEAN Regional Forum and elsewhere, that the United States considered the peaceful resolution of these claims, that the Chinese government did not want to be perceived as losing face or backing down in uh, the face of these claims, but that it was by omission off of its list of vital national interests basically declaring that it was not at this time willing to risk military conflict over these claims. And that was the part that started a, the, uh, what appeared to be a diplomatic campaign by China beginning in 2010 as it began to enter its own uh, uh, political transition away from making these claims that would escalate it. It was a diplomatic, claim to, a diplomatic campaign to soften up some of the approach that had made its Southeast Asian ner neighbors nervous, had bound them together, had led them to become tighter in their ties with the United States and other countries, and had really isolated China in ways that the Chinese diplomatic community viewed that these statements about raising the South China Sea as a vital national interest had in fact backfired, making China's immediate neighborhood much more hostile much more worried about China's rise and whether it was any longer peaceful. This third transition, in other words, seems to be an internal debate in China itself over the last five years that spilled out through this bureaucratic interaction with the United States over whether China would remain as committed to peaceful rise as a strategy or whether it viewed that peaceful rise was not possible that the suspicion of China was so high that no matter what it did, it was going to be viewed skeptically by its neighbors and that China should not even bother with a peaceful rise strategy. That debate that certainly started in military circles in China seemed to spread out in ways that we've seen in this transition or a foreign policy transition and debate within the Chinese community over the last five to seven years. What that effectively did was bring us to the course of the last year or so and the political transition in China, certainly that was expected for some period of time, but that was exacerbated in January of 2012 with the Bo Lai scandal in uh, China itself. China, in my mind, over the last five to seven years or so, has been going through these four transitions that have now culminated with a new generation or a new political leadership in, in China. The transitions are increasing debates within China itself about first, its attitude toward global governance, second, its economic policy, and whether it is departing from the very state capitalism model that many have worried about as an alternative to the free market, presenting a new challenge as it moves from an emerging market to a major economic power, seeking to stabilize the global financial system by providing alternate forms of currency that objectively would not be a bad thing, but subjectively, from Washington's point of view, will be viewed as a threat to US financial power and financial strength from an emerging China. At the same time as you have those global, global governance debates and you have those economic debates, you have these foreign policy debates within China, particularly emanating from the Chinese military, about whether it should be more active about pursuing Chinese interests and whether it was time to make that transition as China was shifting from an emerging power to a major power. And that fourth transition is what we now see entering that I think is uncertain, is the transition about the polit political leadership in China and what its new priorities will be as a new generation is coming into power under Xi Jinping and under the new Chinese leadership. 
the initial assessments of that generation that I've seen as an editor of the Washington Quarterly may have been best represented by a, a businessman whose name is William Overholt or Bill Overholt. Overholt was the author of a book in 1993 called The Rise of China that predated the BRICS report. It predated questions about whether China was an emerging economic power and was in fact written at a time when in the United States questions were running around about whether Japan was the post-Soviet power that was most likely to challenge the United States by those that were concerned about an emerging power. Overholt's conclusion was that China in 1993 was that China was an emerging power on the rise. His conclusion in his latest article that he wrote was that the new generation of Chinese leadership was much more risk averse than the previous leaders that had taken the economic risks and had motivated China's economic rise and had generated the engine of economic reform that led to the success of Chinese economic growth over the course of the last 15 years or so. And if Overholt's conclusion is in fact right, that the Chinese leadership under this generation that is entering is much more risk averse, he was extremely pessimistic that they would be able to address the challenges of the power of state-owned enterprises in the Chinese economy, of the power of the military in the Chinese uh, economic system, and of how to make this transition to a demographic challenge in China as its economy gets older at a time of uh, where the average age of the workforce was becoming older, and the challenges for retirement and how to keep uh, good health and financial security for people out of the Chinese workforce were coming before there was a state that was ready to help support the Chinese workforce. In essence, the answer in my mind to the real China challenge is how does this new generation answer these four transitions or four debates? In its attitude toward first, global governance, second, its economic model, third, its foreign policy presence, and fourth, its own political transition in this new generation going forward. And with that, I'd like to wrap it up and have this engage in a dialogue more and questions about it. These, to me, are unanswered questions that present a lot of uncertainty and have been the sources of a lot of instability in not just U.S.-China relations, but China's relations with a lot of its neighbors, leading to a rise of concern over the last four years about China's growth. And how it answers these questions, I think, are what presents the real China challenge for us as we see this new political generation entering power.